All right, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, probably still good morning. Uh, uh, welcome uh, to our webcast, and welcome to everyone uh, for our first keynote. I'm Peter Brasilovsky, I'm one of the program committee members here, and my job is to introduce our first keynote speaker, which is uh, with Mike Sharples. Uh, so Mike is a really unique person. I'm really glad that we were able to host him here. Uh, he has been in a, a illustrious career in educational technology. Uh, recently retired as a professor of education technology at British Open University, but as he says, he's uh, more busy than ever uh, uh, once he starts his retirement, and he has been working on making sure that technology and people connect well in educational technologies. Human-centered design of educational technology, I would say. Um, I'm excited to have Mike here because I was uh, working with him as a, a co-editor of a major educational technology journal, and we both retired for that position this year, and I'm really excited to hear what Mike has to say to us. Welcome. Thank you, Peter. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, because I've heard a lot about the cyber learning community but haven't had an opportunity to, to meet and to interact with you. I'll be staying for both days, so I'll be happy to have lots of discussions. There probably won't be much time for questions at the end, so uh, I'll be glad to meet with you later. Um, I'm from the Open University in the UK, and I just want to say a little bit about that logo at the top right there. Um, the Open University, 50 years. So that's 1969. 1969 was a momentous year. The US, uh, it was a culmination of a huge, an, uh, amazing engineering program to put two people on the moon to bring back moon rock. And in the UK, it was the start of an amazing educational program, which was to build a completely new type of university that would be open to all, that would engage people in high quality education at higher education level. And two million people have benefited from courses at the Open University since then. And it's still going. So just a few words about the Open University and what it is. Its mission is to be open to people, places, methods, and ideas. And we take that very seriously. So it provides access to higher education for anyone who has a desire to learn. So there's no prior qualifications. We take people with no prior qualifications. And at all ages, the youngest graduate is age 14, the oldest is 95. There are 170,000 current students, so it's the largest university in the UK and one of the largest in Europe. Um, and because it's open to anyone, then we have special interest in uh, supporting people with disabilities, 24,000 students with disabilities. And right from the start, the aim was to provide the highest quality teaching and learning. So it wasn't a sort of low quality, um, uh, correspondence education uh, institution. It was a full university and still is, and it provides what we call supported open, uh, supported open learning. So every student has a personal tutor. Uh, in that sense, it's like Oxford and Cambridge. So small groups of uh, students work together with a personal tutor, but they also work at a distance. Um, it's a research-led university, and right from the start, We've had a partnership with the BBC, so two great institutions in the UK, the BBC and the Open University. Um, and it's also the first cyber learning university. So the teaching and learning methods were based on work from an education technologist and an education theorist called Gordon Pask uh, around developing learning as a networked and as a conversational process. So it, right from the start, has been a cyber learning university. I work at the Institute of Educational Technology, which was also founded 50 years ago, to support and to research into the practices of teaching and learning with technology. Um, in the 1970s, because we wanted to engage people at all um, backgrounds in their own contexts, then for science learning, we sent out home experiment kits. We sent out lasers through the post so that students could de develop their own holograms. We sent out geology kits um, through the post, and you can see 
a student there working with an open university geology kit, rock samples, microscopes. And then we realized in about the mid-1990s that science was becoming more digital. Um, science, you know, good quality science was being conducted online. And so we started to develop a range of digital tools for learning. One of our most successful has been the virtual microscope. Uh, and the principle behind a lot of our digital tools is having virtual environments but using real data. So the virtual microscope is, provides a way to look at and interact with real geological data, real slides, including geological data you couldn't look at in the lab, such as moon rock samples. So we have very high resolution samples taken from the Apollo astronauts, and you can zoom in uh, to those samples, look at them under different magnifications, look at them under polarized light, so you can interact digitally with real information, but in a virtual world. Uh, and in 2012, we set up FutureLearn, which is Europe's largest MOOC platform um, with over 9 million uh, learners. So that's a bit of background from um, the Open University and the Institute of Educational Technology. But since 2012, we've had a particular focus on pedagogy. Um, by pedagogy, I mean the theory and practice of teaching, learning, and assessment and how you can use theory and practice of teaching, learning, and assessment to inform the design of innovations in education. We've published a series of reports since 2012, one each year. Uh, in 2015, uh, the report was published in collaboration with SRI, and in fact, it's been our most successful report. We've had over 300,000 downloads of those reports. Uh, and they're free, being the Open University. I've got a few copies here which you're welcome to, um, to look at and to take. Um, and also a book that I've um, written that summarizes and extends the work of those innovating pedagogy reports. So I want to say a little bit more about pedagogy um, because I really want to try and emphasize that pedagogy should be put on the same level as technology. Um, technologies alone are not going to transform education. It's that combination of pedagogy and technology which will bring about real transformation. Now here's, I can't put up all 40 um, that I mentioned in the book, so I'm just going to concentrate on a core set of pedagogies there. Um, and each of these um, can be supported and enabled by technology. You can take any one of those um, let's take embodied halfway down, uh, wearable technologies can support embodied learning. Any of those uh, pedagogies can be supported and enhanced by technology. But that list can be used in two ways. One way is to um, look at existing teaching practices and to say, what are the pedagogies underlying them? What goes on in my classroom? Uh, is it primarily um, case-based learning? Is it primarily delivered context? Is there an inquiry learning element? So what goes on in my classroom? But also it can be used in a generative way. You could ask the question, what would um, game-based inquiry-driven learning look like? What would performative collaborative learning look like if it were in the classroom or if it were online? So you can use it to generate new ways of teaching and learning. And you can also use it to inform uh, the design of new educational technologies. So that's why I want to go next. So you can use pedagogy to inform the design of new ways of learning with technology. So this is a standard approach now for developing new technologies, an agile design process. And many of the um, new forms of learning technology are developed using this method. You start off with an idea concept, something that um, you want to be able to uh, embody in a technology. And you go through a process of design and development, which leads to a release, which is then tested. Uh, and you provide feedback uh, to the design team. And now with agile design processes, this is usually very quick. 
the cycles can be as uh, short as two weeks. So you go through rapid cycles of design, release, testing, and feedback, but informed by an idea concept. Now, pedagogy-informed design of cyber learning is to say, how can we take those pedagogies as the initial idea concept? So we can start an agile process of education technology development from one or more of those pedagogies. And I want to give you an example of that, which is to take inquiry-based learning and to say, how can you then inform the design of cyber learning starting from inquiry-based learning? But also, what we've been interested in is how can you do this at scale? So which sorts of pedagogies can work at scale? Now, just quickly about learning at scale. Um, there are some pedagogies that just don't work as you get larger. So let's say sports coaching. It might work for tennis coaching for two, three people. 100, it would be pretty difficult. There are some methods of teaching and learning that are pretty impervious to scale. What I'm doing now, lecturing, um, it works for a room here. It's also working online for the people who are watching. In fact, it's probably working better for them because they can pause, they can rewind if they want to. Um, but what, technology, what pedagogies get better with scale? Um, well, one of them is learning through conversation and networking. The more people who take part, the richer the conversations become. And it works better in scale. That was the principle behind the development of the FutureLearn platform. It was based around learning as conversation. But what we've wanted to do recently is to say, can you do the same with inquiry-based learning? Can you design an inquiry-based learning that will get better with scale? Now, why inquiry-based learning? Inquiry is central to learning because once students learn how to ask good questions and to find valid answers, they can become active learners in any subject. It's asking the good question and searching for answers to those questions individually or together that allow them to become active learners. Now, we've been looking at a scalable version of inquiry learning that we call citizen inquiry. And it brings together the benefits of citizen science, collaborative inquiry learning with a dash of crowdsourcing. So citizen science is science enacted and enabled by people, by citizens. But with citizen science, the starting point is a scientist. Um, the scientist who has uh, a question to ask, which then is carried out by members of the public. So the scientist recruits members of the public. What we've been interested in doing is flipping that round. So it's members of the public. It could be students in a classroom. It could be community groups. They ask the question and then get scientists and other people involved to try and answer it. So it involves collaborative inquiry learning, uh, answering a question by working together with many other people online. And that's where the crowdsourcing comes in. So um, instead of trying to raise money through crowdsourcing, you're trying to raise other people. You're trying to get other people engaged in your project. So that's the idea behind citizen inquiry. It starts with a question, with an investigation from an individual or a group. You then recruit as many people as you can to try and answer that question. And in doing so, you form a community of inquiry. So the learning through citizen inquiry is first how to be a citizen scientist. And citizen science for large-scale scientific research is becoming a favored model. You can do large-scale investigations when you get many people involved. You learn how to become a lifelong learner because active learning starts by asking big questions. You learn how to form and sustain a community of inquiry, questioning, reasoning, connecting, deliberating, challenging, and developing problem-solving techniques. By recruiting other people to try and help answer your question, your big question, you're developing and maintaining a community of inquiry. And uh, as John Dewey um, said many years ago, 
The environment in which human beings live, act and inquire is not simply physical, it's cultural as well. Problems which induce inquiry grow out of the relations of fellow beings to one another. So you're creating a culture of inquiry through large-scale citizen investigations. So at the Open University, we've developed a new platform for this called Inquire, N-Q-U-I-R-E. You can access it, www.enquire.org.uk. It's a collaboration with the BBC. So let me just say something about the relationship between the Open University and the BBC. Many years ago, the BBC was essentially a way of transmitting aspects of learning to members of the public. TV programs that were broadcast uh, late at night that anybody could watch. Now the relationship is much more that um, we work in partnership with the BBC. And this is a new form of partnership. In the past, they have had mass experiments, starting with TV programs and involving hundreds of thousands of members of the public, uh, something called Lab UK. But they've never had a platform for doing that. What we've done in partnership with the BBC is develop a platform for those mass scale experiments. So it extends citizen inquiry to include mass multimedia surveys and other sorts of investigations. And the platform offers two sorts of investigations, confidential survey type missions. So think of something like SurveyMonkey, but then think of how you would design the ideal SurveyMonkey for scientific investigations, for instance, with built-in consent forms, being able to have multimedia prompts, multimedia uh, images, for example, that the um, respondents can upload. Uh, so uh, it's a kind of souped up, uh, extended version of a survey platform, but also open social missions, where all of the data is open for anybody to see. So all of the responses can be seen by anybody else and can be the basis for communication and collaboration. And that's where the benefits of scale come in. You can interact with other people around the data. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, so that's the front page of Inquire. And just four examples. The first one, earlier this year, was a collaboration between the BBC, the Open University, and the British Trust for Ornithology to do a national survey of British gardens. So there'd never been a survey of British gardens before. There's more land, more green space in Britain in our gardens, in private gardens, than all the national parks put together. But nobody's ever surveyed them because it was really difficult to get each individual person to um, talk and to give data about their gardens. We, through primetime BBC TV programmes, um, carried out an investigation. There were over 200,000 people um, contributed to that survey. So we now have a massive amount of data on British gardens. The second one is a feel-good test, which is an investigation with University College London into creativity and well-being, and provided each person who took part with personalised feedback. And there were 43,000 people took part in that, with 70% completion rate. And then open social missions, one down there in the bottom left, um, People who are interested in clouds, cloud spotting, um, ranging from people who just like posting pretty pictures of clouds up to uh, amateur and semi-professional meteorologists. You can post a picture of clouds, get other people to try and help you identify the cloud formation and discuss unusual cloud formations. That's an open social mission. And the last one, students at the Open University are using the platform to run investigations into online and offline learning. So that garden watch, I'm particularly pleased with that because it's a survey of UK gardens, primetime TV. The people who took part are not your standard scientists. The, 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 the age was around 40, the, the median age was around 40 to 45 years old. Most of them were women. And they were interested in their gardens, not in their technology. And so being able to provide a platform where they could survey their gardens, provide the data, was really important. And at peak times, we had 10,000 pe 10, people accessing the platform a minute, 65% on mobile devices. So it's not the case now that you design for desktop and then some people will use mobile devices. The majority of people are accessing 
that on mobile devices. And um, these are some of the uh, responses, not on our platform, but on social media around it. People posting pictures of their um, gardens, their wildlife, uh, engaging in discussion around the investigation. So it became not only a platform for providing data, but a context for building a community around that investigation. Now, inquiry is multiply open, and this is where I really want to emphasize, we're the open university, we make platforms that are open. So the, the source code is open. It's open for anybody to participate in any mission. So you're welcome to join any of the, the missions. But also, it's open for any person or organization to create a new mission. We call them missions on the platform. If you want to create a survey, if you want to create an investigation yourself, with the students in your um, class, with your university, you can use the platform to create a uh, science investigation and get thousands or tens of thousands of people involved. And it's open for discussion of visible data. So it's multiply open. And the sort of learning is learning by asking good questions, learning by engaging in good science together, um, particularly those open missions, learning by analyzing and sharing results. So you can also publish the results because you've got huge amounts of data. You can publish those results. Um, so you've got multiple ways of learning on the platform. But I just want to finish off by sum summarizing some of the issues that we've found with developing inquiry-based learning at big scale. Because with great scale comes great responsibility. What sorts of responsibilities? Firstly, huge diversity. If you've got 200,000 people taking part in an investigation, you're going to have a huge diversity of abilities, cultures, and locations. And you want to support people from those different backgrounds. You've got big data. That big data can be used for good, or it can be used for ill. And we want to make sure that the big data is used in responsible ways. There's a tension, and part of the theme of this event is about trying to resolve tensions. There's a tension between open data and personal privacy. So, for example, that garden survey, we wanted to have the data open so that anybody could post their data, they could discuss it, but we couldn't. For example, one of the questions there um, was, uh, you can see it there, which of the following enclose your garden? wall or neighboring building, you're asking people to provide information about the security of their garden. And it was needed for the scientific purposes of that survey. So there's a tension between open data and personal privacy. And there's a similar tension between robust science and social learning. Uh, for robust science, you want stratified samples, you want um, representative samples. For social learning, you want everybody to take part no matter what their background and ability. And there's a tension between open access and bad science. So if you provide an open platform for anybody to contribute and for anybody to create a new mission, you're going to get people who are wanting to do missions on ghost hunting or missions on astrology. Do you put them onto the platform or not? What we've got is a three-stage process where you can develop a mission and preview it, where you can open it to a small group of people, and then you can open it more broadly. Um, and each stage, you've got a review process. And finally, research ethics. Um, I just want to finish with this. I like acronyms. Um, so ethical design of cyber learning, going back to the Open University's mission, an acronym mission. So firstly, multiple media devices partners. So to have good cyber learning, you need to engage multiple media, and you need to choose a media that are appropriate for the task. You start with the pedagogy, and then you choose the media. Secondly, independent verification. So um, verifying the data, but also um, verifying that the platform is robust and secure. So we have external uh, validators for both the platform and for the data. A secure environment. So we make sure all of the data is stored locally. We don't send it off to a cloud platform. Um, support for learners. It's not enough 
just to provide a platform that people can come to. You need to look at ways in which you can engage scientists, uh, engage educators in supporting the learners. An inquiry learning process, starting from learners' needs. Open access, so enabling access and learning for all. And lastly, analytics. Because you've got this um, huge amount of data, then you can use the, those data, that analytics, to support learning. So I want to just leave you with that as um, a checklist, if you like, for ethical design of cyber learning. And the final slide, technology alone is not going to transform education. We need to focus on pedagogy, methods of teaching and learning with new technology, not just the technology alone. Thank you. I don't know if there's any time for talk questions. Probably not. See me at lunchtime.